So hopefully you're here for packing it in, talking about containers and configuration management. If you're not, you probably want to be in the other room. Um, so uh, this talk is going to be hopefully what you were hoping it was going to be about. It's really a little bit of technical, but a little bit of philosophical, because that's how we roll at Chef. So who am I? I'm a senior consulting engineer with Chef. Um, I have a little over eight years of experience um, planning and managing web scale and enterprise uh, applications. Uh, I've been with Chef for a little over a year, been using Chef for a while. Um, I've been playing around with Docker probably for the last six or eight months. Um, I'm also an avid woodworker, so when I'm not building things with code, I'm building things with wood. So in general, I'm just a maker at heart, right? Um, so let me tell you about a little bit about what this talk is not, right? So this talk is not about joining a cult. How many times have you heard about a new technology and there was like, you should only use this technology. Everything you've learned up until now, you should just throw away and rewrite everything in this new technology and it will be great because it solves all your problems, right? How many people have heard that before? Just throw it away, right? Okay. So there's a lot of opinions out there, right? We have opinions, they have opinions, everybody has opinions about there's only one right way to manage your systems and your applications. In reality, that true path is a combination of those systems. You take the pieces you, you like, and you leverage them to their strengths. You kind of put together a toolbox, right? So you want a toolbox and not just one tool. So if we think about configuring systems, we have a few options that exist today. Um, so I'll talk about each of these individually, but realistically, you've got a chisel machines, you've got pristine virtual machines, you've got isolated containers, you've got configuration management, maybe you use all or some of the above. So one thing I like to do is kind of ask people, so how many people are still configuring systems by hand? Anybody? No? All right, got some. How many people have like, moved on to having virtual machines where they have an image and then they just create a virtual machine on Amazon or Rackspace or something? Okay, a little bit more. How many people are actually using containers today? Hey, sweet. Are you using it in production? Not yet. Not yet. Right. Okay. And how many people use some kind of automated configuration management? Cool. All right. Sweet. So what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take you, talk to you a little bit about how to use all of them, right? And honestly, I think that that's really the, the end solution for a majority of people. So let's talk about artisanal machines made of metal and sweat. Do we really need to talk about why this is suck? Why this sucks for most people, right? This is hard. This is where you start getting these like directories full of scripts things that you've kind of created over time. Maybe you have all of them, you're out of the office and then nobody can deploy anything because they can't get access to your laptop, right? Um, if you really want to work on artisanal crafts, take up woodworking. Um, building servers by hand today is really only good when your scale is maybe two to three servers. If you get over that, over, anything over that, you're basically wasting a lot of time. You could be spend actually adding features to your application by building up servers manually. So what's the next thing? Let's talk about virtual machines and containers together, because this is something that confuses people, especially people who've never heard of containers before. Although containers have been around for decades, right? Like we taught there are Solaris zones, there's FreeBSD jails. You know, container, containerization has been a concept that's been around for a while, and it's never really caught on until the advent of the LXC and the Docker community. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to make some definitions here. So containers are applications and their dependencies running in isolation in user land outside of the kernel. That means that they just happen to be, have a file system, and they're just using all the resources from the underlying host system. A virtual machine, on the other hand, is really like a full-blown machine. It includes the fully functional operating system. It's managed by a hypervisor. There's a lot of overhead that comes with this. And so if you think about containers from a, from a concept of, hey, all I have is my application bits. I don't have to worry about all this other stuff because that's managed somewhere else. You can see that the appeal starts to grow pretty rapidly for people that are just literally don't want to have to deal with all this ri wasted resource at the hypervisor level. So hooray, we can go back to golden images, right? Um, golden images are the concept of uh, I have created a server I will take a snapshot of it, and I will bring it back up whenever I want, and I never have to touch it again, and it's great. Right? Um, unfortunately, this problem still exists with containers. It's just on a smaller scale. 
right? So the problem with golden, golden images is you make a, you, 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 you configure your system, you spin it up, three months down the road, you spin up a new one, and time has progressed. And now you have a server that actually isn't what you want it to be. You have to do all these manual configurations down the road. Or you have to set up some out-of-band process to continue to manage those images and keep them updated and groom them and, and put them in a corral and make sure that they're all well-fed. So the problem with container images is that this dozen of server images that were like the big box, they all of a sudden become dozens of container images. So now you're having to maintain images for not just a web server, but for Apache container, for uh, your database container, for um, specific uh, connectors, like the underlying supports that go into making your overall server what it is. Now, the one good thing that, that Docker kind of introduced and kind of I think why, why it's kind of spread out some wildfire is that um, they've added the idea of layered file systems, right? So now you can treat your file system kind of like a git commit history. You make a change, it makes a new entry point, you can roll back, you can roll forward, it's pretty awesome, right? So it mitigates some of it, but you, you end up with a limit, right? You can only go up to a certain number of layers before you're just done, right? You can't add any more layers, you have to create a new image and start over. Um, so, and then at the end of the day, right, no matter what you do with any kind of golden image, whether it's a virtual machine or a container, you're really just kicking the can down the road about by modularizing and having these things off and thinking they're some kind of immutable state that will never change, right? Um, that's just really not a reality when you get into a production system. So what about configuration management? I like configuration management. I work at Chef, right? Why wouldn't I like configuration management? Um, so when we talk about configuration management, I want to talk about two different terms. So how many people have heard of Mark Burgess? Nobody? You guys should totally read his stuff. He's like the scientist that invented like automated configuration management. He's awesome. So he's a quote up here that says, convergence is like fixing the outcome and computing the route, kind of like a GPS finder. And then congruence is about repeating a recipe in a sequence known to massage the system into, into shape. So I shortened that, right, to basically two real short definitions. When we talk about converging a system, convergence on a system, we talk about I want to come to a desired end state. I want my service to be running on this port and serving up this content, right? And this is the, the convergence is the process to get there. Um, the congruence is really where you have a blank slate and you're configuring from scratch every single time, right? And so congruence can actually end up taking a lot of time. And what I've seen over the years is that people, when they come into configuration management, is they just assume that they always want to start with a base image that has nothing on it, and then I want to build from scratch every single time. And as your application gets more complex, gets more dense, that time gets longer and longer, and then you get frustrated, right? Things that also uh, tend to matter a lot when you start to look, view configuration management from a congruence point of view is that you know, your, your application versions become really, really important, right? So if you aren't pinning your, your versions, you might end up in a situation to where you've spun up one server and it's at a specific version. You've since incremented to a different uh, version of your application. You spun up another server. Now that's at a different version than what your original running state is. And now you have to maintain or in, and actually converge that system to get to the known point at the end. So what if I told you that in reality, you can actually run um, images, I'm talking about virtual machines, containers, and configuration management all together, and they can peacefully coexist, right? This can actually happen. So let's talk about some real world situations. So if you think about an application system, it generally has an operating system layer that doesn't really change very often. Sure, you get security patches, you might get some, some uh, library updates or something at the system level, but by and large, you stick with a the operating system layer that doesn't really change that often. You have a few supporting applications that make your application go, and they change semi-frequently, right? You might take new feature releases as they come out. Maybe you have a, a, a full release upgrade. But then what you really care about and this is the hard part that people get so distracted with everything else, is your application code, right? Like, the only thing that you really care about is having your application code get out there as quickly as possible. You don't care, really, unless your, fe your application has a dependency on a new feature of a supporting application about anything else, right? Nginx, 
Postgres, um, whatever you're, you're, you're actually using to run your application. So if you think about this, you can kind of translate these layers into a VM image that acts as a ba base OS and some additional deltas, right, some patches, um, container images that have those supporting applications, and then configuration management to maintain that overall all state of the entire system. So wait, you just took it from, like, I have this one golden image, and now I just have to update it, but now I have, like, these three layers of things. This seems really complex, right? But actually, it's pretty simple now that the tooling has evolved, right? And for the, the actual technical part of this talk, I'm going to demo three different tools that kind of manage each of these layers. So Packer, how many people have heard of Packer before, right? Packer's awesome if you've never used it before. It basically automates. The, the creation of, of machine images. We'll talk about Chef, and that'll use to, uh, we'll build Docker images, we'll provision our actual VM that we've, that, uh, from the image we build with Packer, and we'll actually manage the configuration of running containers. And then Docker is the, uh, the Docker uh, server API that actually manages the containers and, and makes sure they're running and provides some useful information on them. So let's talk about Packer really quick. Looks about like maybe half the room kind of has used Packer is familiar with it. So if anybody's ever had to manage virtual machine images, half the battle is keeping those images up to date. Um, Packer's gone a uh, done a lot to make this way easier. Um, now you don't have to spin up a new uh, server at a base OS, then do a bunch of configuration, and then take a snapshot, and then save that snapshot off somewhere. Packer's kind of automated all this. This is what Packer's configuration looks like. It's a big JSON blob. Um, you can put different things in here. This is similar to what the configuration we'll use for the demo here later. Um, we're going to spin up, uh, we, say we have a source AMI, we can tell what instance type, all kinds of things. Um, it also can take prov provisioners, so Chef, Ansible, Puppet, like all of these different tools Packer can actually interact with to work. So the reason why Packer is awesome is because the more time you spend refreshing VMs, the more table flipping that will ensue. Because how many times, uh, the, the number of times that I've actually had to sit around and basically waste an entire day by refreshing 15 different images because I have a syslog.conf update that needed to go out to all, the, all of the different machines that we have baked into our golden images, I, I, I don't even know how to quantify uh, the anger that I felt doing that. Um, you can actually also programmatically interface with Packer, right? So if you, you could, since it's all JSON, Right? You could generate JSON objects and drop them off into a CI system, and then have Packer build out of a base template and do any modifications. Right? So you could use this exact same template and switch out the run list for Chef for different applications if you wanted to build out sort of like a, an image bakery for whatever your virtualization platform is. So let's talk about Docker. So Docker is not necessarily just containers. Um, a lot of people, when they first find out about Docker, they hear about it, and they you know, really probably haven't heard about containers before. As I mentioned, Docker's actually a combination of, originally, Linux containers using LXC with AUFS, which is a file system um, that creates these portable, lightweight application containers. Now, Docker has since evolved, and the containerization method um, is actually abstracted away. So right now, it still goes to LXC, but the architecture under their library is allow, allows people to plug in support for zones, support for jails, whatever containerization technology you choose to use. The same goes with the storage backend. Originally it was AUFS. Now there are other options, but it still defaults to that. So um, Docker containers are just running instances of Docker images, right? So Docker puts everything together, creates a a layered file system based off the changes, and the Docker containers are actually just running those images through the Docker server. Um, the cool thing about Docker images is they can share them. You can have a local repository, or you can share them on the Docker repository in the cloud, right? So you can share them with your friends. You can have official ones. Uh, they just announced at DockerCon a few weeks ago that they have this, this certified uh, container image um, status, right, where you can actually get a MySQL container image from Oracle, right? Um, and then this last bullet point generally uh, generates the most uh, conflict whenever you talk to somebody in the Docker community or familiar with the Docker community. 
So they can either be a single application process or a lightweight virtual machine if a supervisor is provided. So it's very key to note that last few lords there. A Docker container by design is designed to run one process at a time. It has one entry point. You can only start a service, manage one single process that's running with that container. Now, people have realized that, you know what? There's actually some, there's some capacity resource gains to be made here. If I treat my containers as lightweight virtual, uh, virtual machines, but I still have to have a supervisor to manage my services in there because I only have one entry point. So um, we believe that you should have choice in your use of technology. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about more how Chef interacts with containers uh, in a second. But realistically, it's kind of a divided community right now in terms of uh, which is the right way. But again, this isn't about joining a cult. It's about having options and using the tools to get the things done that you need to get done. So what's Chef? How many people have actually heard of Chef before I walk up here? Sweet! I love that. Awesome. So I won't drain the slide then. It's an automation platform. It lets you manage your infrastructure's code. Um, you can have reusable recipes. Um, and then the key part here is that this information amongst your different components is actually stored, can be stored centrally on a server, and that can be used to inform the configuration of other systems in your infrastructure topology. Um, it can run on demand or as a, uh, or as a managed service, uh, and it keeps your infrastructure convergent. Right? Going back to those two terms that we had earlier, right? it converges. So if it comes out of line, it handles configuration drift, gets it back to where you want it to be. So the new thing that I want to talk about that kind of plugs these two, thing, two concepts together of configuration management and containers is Chef Container. So um, if anybody like avidly watches the Chef blog, we did post a blog uh, post today about the release of the 0.2.0 version which is beta of the Chef container. So essentially what this is, it's a version of the Chef client that includes support for running the Chef client from within a Linux container. So what this is, is we have built a base container image. Um, right now, on, I think Ubuntu is, the, is the, the operating system that we have hosted on the registry right now. Um, but it's packaged with Chef client. It has run it to act as a supervisor. And it has uh, a service called Chef init. Um, and essentially, it allows you to bootstrap that container without entering via SSH. So remember I mentioned before, the Docker containers are only really designed to have one entry point. Right? They're designed for one process. That was the original design. Now what we've done is we've created, a, we've created a base container for you to use that lets Chef drive as many services as you want to run within a container, as many configuration changes as you want, et cetera. Um, you can actually use all of your existing Chef client resources the same way you would, just on a Linux-based system, because there is no Windows containerization yet, for real. Um, and you can manage those multiple services with Chef in it and run it. And so I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a couple of slides. Um, the other thing that we've got that goes pairs along with this is that uh, we have this Knife container plugin, which allows you to initialize and build these container images. So we've got knife container docker init and knife container docker build. So right now we have support for Docker, which is actually abstracting a lot of containers underneath for us. So that was the easiest one to start with. But we have plans for directly supporting other container methods down the road. Um, we also have Berkshelf integration. If anybody has heard of Berkshelf, um, it is a dependency management tool uh, to allow you to say, if I have dependent cookbooks and I'm not specifically declaring them, I will detect them and make sure that they get uh, installed into my container as well. And it also supports uh, Chef Zero or Chef Local Mode, um, uh, as well as Chef Client Modes. Now what I'm going to show when we start to build is the Chef Client Mode, because I think that that's where the most exciting part of how all this stuff fits together. So let's talk about, bring it off, let's step off of the Chef here for a second, and just talk back to our three-tiered model. So the key to starting off your container, uh, you know, your actual infrastructure topology, is starting with a good foundation. Right? You want to start off with as, m as minimal configuration as possible, but not too minimal. Right? There are some core co components that you probably want to identify when you're building that base VM. 
that are, that are unlikely to change, but they're different from whatever the default settings are. Things like your security policy specific to your organization, any uh, image hardening processes as you do on installing packages, things of that nature, um, any core component packages, and then Docker tooling, right? You want to get the actual Docker tooling that manages the Docker components onto your base image so that it's there, right? And you don't have to worry about it. The goal that you should aim for in terms of managing a VM image is to create uh, combine the components that are consistently configured across your entire application infrastructure and only those pieces, the things that aren't going to change. They're only going to change pretty much as often as your operating system changes, right? Um, but don't get tempted to just strip it away and just have a straight bare install and then manage a bunch of consistent configuration that's going to happen to happen every single run all the time. So here's a quick demo. So this is using Packer to build the VM. So essentially, it's a pretty quick command, packer build, and then I have the JSON file that I created earlier. You can see it connects to Amazon, spins up an instance, and it goes through and runs. Now I have edited the videos here for brevity so that we're not spending like forever waiting for Amazon to actually give me a machine and then save an image. Um, so it goes through and, uh, and updates uh, apps. It'll go through and actually configure all the things that I just talked about. We're using a base Ubuntu system. We're going to throw on the minimal uh, packages needed to support Docker, and then we're going to get Docker installed. And we're also going to go ahead and pull down in this step uh, the image that we need. See, it's going to keep going here. So it's install Chef, right? So because, you know, Chef's going to manage your host as well as it will your guest containers. Um, it unpacks Chef, kind of moves along. This is uh, where the supporting co content comes in. And it copies over your cookbooks, right? So all the cookbooks you've already been using outside of containers, it'll copy over the cookbooks you need to configure. It'll go through and run Chef client, uh, start up the client, and then configure everything. Do, do, do. This was way longer before I got it down, so you're so lucky, right? It's almost done. So yeah, so you can see here it's actually gone through and set up all the Docker. It's stopped the ser Docker service. It started back up. It's going to provision the actual uh, Docker container here. And let's just skip ahead here. Runs through Chef Client Run, finishes. Uh, it goes to stop the source instance. If anybody's used Amazon, you have to configure your machine, stop it, and then you actually make your AMI. So this packer is actually automating all of this. Uh, it's waiting for the instance to stop. It creates a new AMI, and then deletes all the temporary security groups and everything. So with packer, you don't even actually have to give it much other than your AWS credentials to go in, because it'll create its own um, security groups and everything and tear everything down once it's done. So at the end, you can see that the build is finished. Um, and I've been given an AMI ID. Uh, it, I chose US West 2 to actually do the build in uh, because, of course, US East 1 was overcrowded with everybody else at Chef building stuff. So, um, so now that we've built the VM, we have an image for our core VM. Now we're moving on to building the Docker factory. Right? So what we need is a repeatable factory or a process to build our Docker container images for the supporting applications. So if you've been using Chef before you started using Docker, you probably already have a bunch of Chef cookbooks that already do this stuff. Or if you're using some other configuration management tool, right? You probably already have a bunch of stuff to configure all these things, and you want to know how to put it into a Docker container without having to rewrite everything as you know, run steps in a Docker file. So the Chef container actually lets us use those existing cookbooks to create those images. Um, the key to success when you're trying to figure out how small should I go with a container is create the smallest images that will work. Right? Um, I, you know, I try to focus on one service at a time, um, but sometimes that's not enough. Right? Maybe you don't want to deal with mounting file systems and sharing them across containers. Maybe you don't want to deal with networking between containers. So you can load them up if you want to. Um, but again, create the smallest self-contained package that will work so that you can ship it across and send it to different people pretty easily. You can also hook up your CI systems to crank out new images as, as cookbook, cookbooks are updated. 
So say I have uh, build, I'm building a, a container off a set of cookbooks, I've updated, I've pushed to my Git repository, that triggers my CI system to say, hey, there's a change, I'm gonna go and build a new image, and I'm gonna add a new layer onto the existing image that's in the repository, and there you go, right? Everything's fully automated. So let's talk about how I'm gonna do this manually. So this isn't hooked up to a CI, but essentially your CI would run this knife container init command first. <coughs> And exactly what this is doing is it's copying all of the configuration cookbooks that you need out of your local repository, along with some credentials and some first boot information on how to actually run Chef Client within your container. So then I did the build command, which is simply just, hey, take the existing uh, Docker image that I just, the Docker image context that I just created, and go ahead and build it. And so what you're seeing here now is actually, well, I went pretty fast. So, I tripped it down too far. It went pretty fast, but essentially it spun up a container using that image, and it configured Chef within that container, and then it added all the steps according to how Docker files, the, how Docker generally works, is I have, I'm doing a series of commands, and each one of those commands enters a new layer in my file system. So the next thing I did was I pu I'm pushing this to the Docker repository, and you can see all of these layers and the steps that I did while configuring this container. So all these image already pushed, these are layers from the base Ubuntu image that we started from. So they already existed, we didn't need to push them again. So all I'm really pushing are the deltas for the additional steps that I added for this specific build of the container. And this is almost done here. So now you can see it's actually successfully pushed, right? So you can see where the top where the first entry point of what we actually configured started hitting, so it starts pushing these. Which is really great because now you're not uploading the gigantic 450 megabyte image every single time, you're only uploading the maybe 40 megabytes worth of changes we actually made out of our base container. So it tags it, it puts it, it makes it available on Docker so that you can actually go through and pull it remotely from any machine that has uh, network connectivity. If you had, you can set up your own Docker repository within your internal data center if you don't have internet connectivity as well. It's just a matter of pointing it to the right uh, registry. And so at the end, it's pushed, it's available. So now we've had this factory that built these containers and they're out and available somewhere for our our server that we built the image for before that's gonna manage all our Docker and containers can now pull that content down. So let's bring it all together. So now we've got our base VM, we've got our Docker factory running. Let's manage an active application stack. So we're gonna use Chef to provision the whole thing at this point. We used Chef all along, however, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do your typical uh, bootstrapping process and we're gonna use Amazon again. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna provision the servers, we're gonna build and run the Docker containers, and then overall convergence, which I'll show actually live, and hopefully it won't blow up on me. Um, here in a second, uh, you can actually see changing the state of the configuration of a running container. So this really long command is only long because I haven't put stuff in a configuration file. Um, but this is your knife, how to create uh, servers on EC2. I've given it a run list. I've given it some information. I've hidden my AWS keys because that's not my first talk where I've shown my keys and had to change them. So uh, it requests an image, uh, requests a server based off of the image that we baked earlier. Um, it show, it gets the system up, it runs Bootstrap Chef on it, it goes through and runs a Chef client run. And at the end of this run, you'll see here in a second, uh, you'll see that it downloads the image that we just uploaded from the registry, and then it actually executes the command to run that image as a container. So, keep it going. All right, cool. Yep, so you can see it kind of runs through um, there. So it runs through and it spits out the end. It says, hey, your server is up and running. I've actually executed the command. And I think if I scroll back just a little bit on this video, you can see, yeah, you can see where it actually runs the Nginx container right up here uh, on the video here. It's making the command and just saying, hey, I'm gonna send this off, let's go, right? So, I'm gonna break out of this for a second, and this is where we're gonna do it live. So, let's see if this works. So this is what that server on the video created, right? Has a web page, there's my EC2 address, just says hello, Midwest IO, that's cool. Um, so, I am actually, this is the HTML for that page, right? So all my local workstation, 
So I'm going to come up in here and I'm going to say, we'll do it live, right? I'll save my file. I'll come back. And I will upload my cookbook to my chef server. So I'm using hosted enterprise chef right now. I'm uploading my cookbook. It goes. I'm going to say, you know what? I want to actually push this, right? So how would I know? So I know that this is my instance ID for my host, because uh, I looked at it from the earlier video, right? I grabbed the image ID. I'm going to do an ifssh command, and I'm going to say, um, let me just get some information about Nginx, right? Nginx is the name of the container I've spun up. So I can hit that command. It'll go through, and it'll actually tell me all of the JSON that you would get if you did a Docker command locally. So what I'm coming up here is I can say, hey, look, my container is running. That's awesome. Sweet. Uh, here's my host name. What if I want to actually look information about my, about this wonderful, uh, about this wonderful host? Well, hey, look, it's, now it's in my Chef server. Now I have all this information about a container that's running on my system. I can pull like how frequent, how long ago it was updated, any of its attributes. I can set permissions on it. It's also a searchable object now, so I can query other containers to inform on, hey, which, what MySQL containers are running. Maybe I should go and connect to them, right? Um, so now it's an actual look, it appears as an actual chef node. So that's exciting. What we really want to do is see if, uh, and see if our changes have been made. And if we look, our changes have been made. Now, the way containers work today with Docker is that you can only restart the container, right? not the greatest way. There are some new features that allow you to do an NS enter, which will actually enter into the container to do more of a, of a, a not an up down restart. But today, what we have is we need to actually, um, we need to actually uh, run a restart. So I'll clear this out here so you can see a little bit better. And we will do the restart command. We'll hit restart. And all it does, if anybody's ever used Docker, it just tells you, sweet, there's the name of your container, right? So now it's going to go through and restart. Now, as part of the restart process, what it's going to do is run a chef client run, uh, because that's how the container was built, right? It was built with a chef client run. We have chef client. You restart the container. It runs chef client again. It'll pull down the changes of this HTML file that we just, bit, that we just made, and then it should show up live. So assuming that it's actually finished, whoop, this way. We should, we'll do it live. So now what you're seeing is, is you're actually seeing it pass through from the internet to my VM into my container to serve up this content. It's a really basic example of like updating content within a running container. There are other ways that you could also accomplish this with Docker, um, but this kind of should open up some ideas on how to actually do uh, running configuration management with, with uh, containers that are running and existing today. Um, all right, so in wrapping up, right, or not, all right, so wrapping up, key points to take away from this talk, don't join a cult, right? New technologies come out all the time. Evaluate them, use them to their strengths, and combine them to your toolbox. Use what works to make things move faster, more secure, more stable. Keep your base VM small, but not too small, because you don't want to spend time doing the same thing over and over for every single system. Use your containers to maintain isolated, reusable applications, and then just maintain your overall convergent infrastructure using automated configuration management. Right? So you're using all three of these things together. So if you want to know more information about this stuff, we just, like I said, we just announced on our blog the release of the Chef Container beta. Um, there's some documentation already up on our doc site. Uh, there's also a video demo of this, uh, basically similar to what I've already shown. Um, some more information about Packer and Docker are the links there. I'll post the slides up later so everybody can get to them. Um, but that is it. We've got about five minutes for questions. What questions do you all have? Yeah, can you uh, come up, Mike? So you showed around uh, how a Docker image, um, you ran a chef client through it. So would chef be used to manage Docker, or Docker would be 
doing a chef client run on the nodes how you showed around so what is advisable yeah. like would would is it advisable to you ma- manage uh, docker using chef or mm-hmm. docker through chef right so the only management of configuration that docker actually provides is through a docker file which is essentially just a stepped list of configuration steps it's kind of like a shell script it's a little bit more than that but um so while you could manage it, say, hey, Dockerfile, do all of these things, um, typically uh, what I would suggest is you'd have Chef manage your Docker host, which is hosting all the Docker containers, and then you use the Chef container to actually manage your uh, containers individually as well. And then Docker essentially is the API that maintains the state of those uh, containers of running and tailing logs and other things that it provides. What other questions? So you're running a uh, Chef client run inside the Docker container. Are each of your Docker containers therefore nodes on your Chef client or on your Chef server and therefore count towards like hosted Chef or enterprise Chef? (laughs) Uh, Yes. So a container itself will be count will is essentially a node, right? Uh, In terms of counting uh, against any limits that you may have on your hosted or enterprise Chef, eh. Right? Um, it just depends, right? If you are having, if you, it would be the same as if you had a server that was a virtualization that had a hypervisor on it running a bunch of VMs, right? The same concept, just a little bit lighter. Um, I don't think there's a definitive answer on that, but I would say probably it counts as a node. Um, and one thing I didn't talk about, and I only have a couple minutes, does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So you talked a little bit about um, you can store your container, you can store your containers within a private repo if you want to mm-hmm. store them internally. Um, and then aside from Enterprise Chef or some other type of deployment infrastructure, right. are there other pieces of infrastructure that you may need in order to do this, or is it really just kind of we've already got some of that infrastructure in place, we can look at moving forward with that? Sure. Um, yeah. So I mean, what I showed today only requires a Chef server hopefully source code, because you're storing your infrastructure as code in source control, and then a Docker re- registry of some kind, right? Um, that's really all you need. Um, if you were disconnected and had to hold your own registry, you would probably need an artifact repository for like installing packages, but that's really all you need. OK, thanks. Yep. What other questions? So I got two minutes. One thing I didn't touch on, I don't actually have a slide for, is the chef init process. What that's actually doing is using Runit, which is a process supervisor within your system, and it manages the services themselves. So you could actually start and restart processes within the container using chef, because chef init exists. Right? So by default, you don't have to change anything, but there is a container service resource that also exists um, that you can use to actually uh, define the start and stop commands for service services so that the chef init process can manage them effectively within a container. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you very much.